If you're just about to do a renovation for your property, do you know if your existing home insurance is going to cover you for all of the works? Today I'm meeting up with Douglas, who's from Porterhouse Brokers, and they specialise in renovation insurance. This is completely different to your home insurance, your everyday home insurance. So let's go and have a chat. Douglas, thank you very much for inviting me to your lovely house. Um, I have Douglas here from Porterhouse Brokers. Uh, it's very nice to be with you here today. You're, you specialise in renovation, home, renovation insurance, right? We do, yes. We, um, we run two sides to our business. One is providing insurance brokers with these types of products so they can help their clients. And the other side is a direct business called Renovation Insurance Brokers which deals with retail clients uh, who approach us over the internet for this type of cover when their houses are undergoing works. Okay, all right. Um, can you tell us a little bit of background about you and how you got into Sure, this? so <clears throat> my background, I've been in insurance 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we specialised in farms, estates, um, construction and property. So it's all been about property really for, for that time. But we also get to learn quite a lot about liability and one thing and another and see uh, builders coming into a lot of the listed buildings we were uh, insuring and validating their insurance and one thing and another. And actually what we found out was that the insurance industry dealt with the prospect of clients undertaking works in their properties very badly. Mm -hmm. And so about 10 years ago uh, when I did a management buyout from the insurance brokers I was in. Um, we set up renovation insurance brokers and started trading that to see if we can actually develop products uh, for home renovators mm. and those were people who were at that time really doing works anything between a few tens of thousands up to probably five million. Mm. Uh, nowadays uh, we're a fair bit further down the line. Uh, we support and reinsure the likes of Hiscox at the top end. Um, and so those projects could be anything up to 50, 100 million. Um, but still we have retail products which help ordinary homeowners uh, achieve a decent level of insurance during works. What's the difference between your typical home insurance to renovation insurance? So a typical home insurance only anticipates what will be going on inside the home mm -hmm. is what normal people do. Yeah. So day-to-day uh, -day life is very different from uh, the risk profile of a building undergoing works. Right. So there are no builders in there, there's no scaffolding uh, outside, there's no hot works, so brazing up of pipes mm. or welding or grinding going on, um, and the opportunity for things like water damage claims, burst pipes and all that sort of thing is much, much higher, um, let alone when somebody actually decides to renovate their property and moves out of it, so it's completely unoccupied right. uh, during that time as well. So the risk profile of the two are dramatically different, sure. and standard home insurers uh, really only legislate for normal activity, and it's very difficult for them to factor in renovation, so what they tend to do is to write that sort of cover out of the home insurance policy that they're providing mm. because they don't want to get involved in it because it's a, an unknown quantity and difficult to predict. Is this something that like the everyday homeowner would already know when they become when they take <coughs> out home insurance? Because the other side I would probably say is that um, if anyone was taking on a contractor to, to renovate their home, they would automatically assume that they would be insured and they could claim on them should anything happen. So how, where, where is it different? The real difficulty for most homeowners here is they don't have any acquired knowledge. Yeah. So they're talking to their architect or their project professionals who don't really talk about insurance at all. Yeah. So they're almost sleepwalking into a situation where they're breaching their household insurance conditions okay. without knowing about it because nobody's telling them. Right. Uh, we did a number of focus groups last year in London, Birmingham and Manchester. And in each of those we had 14 people in a room, some of whom had just finished a project, some of them were midway through and some that were about to start. Mm. We asked 
uh, them and I, I actually got somebody who's nothing to do with insurance to take these sessions uh, because I didn't want to lead the audience and um, we asked them how many had actually bothered to tell their home insurers that they were undertaking works and these were works between 30 and 200,000. Mm -hmm. um, of the 14, two on average uh, said they'd actually mentioned it to their insurers right. and of those two, one thought they purchased something but they didn't really know what it was or what yeah. it covered. Okay. And so to answer your question, when contractors actually provide quotes, they'll quite often put the term fully insured yeah. on the bottom yeah. and nobody really knows what fully insured means. And so unless you go into that in a lot of detail, you can't really be sure what they're providing because it could just be liability insurance, mm -hmm. so their public liability cover, yeah. or it could be something more comprehensive. The difficulty with a contractor's liability cover is that in order for you to claim off that insurance, you have to prove negligence, which is really hard. And what we found actually with the people in the focus groups was that none of them had joined up the cause and effect part of what a serious claim actually meant. Mm. They all assumed that one wouldn't happen to start with. And secondly, um, they didn't actually understand what that meant. So if they had a serious fire at home started by a contractor, the contractor had no insurance cover or had breached conditions in their insurance cover which meant they weren't insured, where were their family going to live? Um, who was going to pay for the alternative accommodation? Who was going to pay to put the property right? And what if their home insurer said, actually, you're not covered under your own home policy either, which is usually the case. So none of them had joined up what could happen and what that actually looked like in reality. Yeah. And the only time during the focus group they did was right at the end when we were talking to them about it. And we said, actually, what does your home mean to you? And most of the male um, members of the focus group said, actually, it's a demonstration of all our hard work. It's our biggest single asset. Mm -hmm. um, it's ultimately some security if the whole of our lives went wrong, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Most of the ladies in the room said, well, it's the centre of our family, it's our emotional hub, it's where everything comes from. Yeah. And some people got really quite emotive and emotional about it yeah. um, because they sort of realised what risks they've been running, but totally unwittingly. I guess it goes in conjunction with like, uh, or connection with like being excited about doing that renovation in the first place and you yeah. do probably go six steps too fast uh, or too far ahead um, to think about a, a topic that's really important like insurance and having the right insurance. I mean, being in a position where you can, you believe that you, your contractor has got the right insurance and then only finding out if something happens that they are not even covered for that specific works for instance. Um, and then what their insurance company can, can, can say that they're not covered for that and then... They could do, yes. So, so contractors insurance has lots of caveats in it, has mm -hmm. lots of endorsements on it, okay? And if uh, those caveats on the schedule do something like exclude um, damage due to uh, application of heat so that's a really common one yeah. so they're not allowed to do um, grinding use any naked flames um, which includes welding all that sort of thing mm -hmm. without undertaking certain precautions right. and they need to prove they've done that okay mm -hmm. which is have a fire extinguisher on site cover any combustible areas if they're working in a loft space or something like that sure. and then they need to stop work any hot works an hour before they've finished for the day, go back and check it to make sure there's no source of ignition. Well, how many builders yeah. actually know that there's an endorsement <laughs> like that yeah. on their policy yeah. and actually observe it? Another one's pressure testing and pipe work. Yeah. Uh, we had a, an instance in London, um, be two or three years ago now, where uh, Thames Water put a new two inch main into the basement of a large London property. Okay. The plumbers plumbed up to it, but hadn't pressure tested their pipe work properly. Mm -hmm. um, there was a surging pressure overnight. It blew, 
and the basement filled up with water. So the project was near enough finished. It was just the plant room and the basement bits that needed finishing off. And all of the AV, um, climate control, all of that stuff, all that cabling came down into the basement area. And that was Cat 5, like computer cable. Yeah, yeah. So the bottom two metres of that got wet. And the cabling manufacturer said, actually, we're not going to warrant any of the bandwidth on there. So we had to rip 14 kilometres of cabling out. That really, though, wasn't the worst thing. If the client hadn't had the sort of product that we provide, which covers both the works and the structures for the same thing, all risks insurance, then their alternative accommodation cover under their ordinary household policy wouldn't have operated properly. And these guys, you know, these were at the upper end of the market, so mm. they were spending 15,000 a week on alternative accommodation wow. a few doors down the road. And we paid 225,000 in alternative accommodation. Gosh. So what you've got to think about is not only what the contractor's insurance will or won't cover, yeah. but also how your own insurance in interacts with that. Mm. And what you soon find is that you end up with a loss of control. Yeah. And at the point at which your property is at its highest risk, why would you give responsibility for ins the insurance of it to somebody you don't really know and who knows nothing about insurance? Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. So in the focus groups, actually, um, we gave everybody a post-it pad and we talked about buying specific project insurance to put themselves back in control. And we asked them what they might be prepared to pay for that. And they wrote that on a post-it note and put that in the hat. And then we explained the risks they were running and where the gaps were in cover and one thing and another and what could happen if they left it just to a contractor. Mm. And then asked them at the end what they'd actually pay for it. And actually, they saw the value of it and it was about four times as much. Right. So... <clears throat> What's clear, actually, is that from our distribution channels, we can tell that when people who are reasonably intelligent and cogent um, understand the risks they're running, nine out of ten people buy it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, it's just it, it, when you when you when you say it like that, it's it's. It almost puts everything into context. It's, it's super, really, really important to consider it, like this kind of insurance. It's super simple, but the plain facts of the matter are it's incredibly unexciting. Yeah. You know, compared with how revved people get when they've got a project going on. Yeah. You know, it's all about new bathrooms. You know, an annex for granny, or a you know a new bathroom, a new bedroom for the kids, or whatever it is. Yeah. That's all the really exciting stuff. And what colours are we going to have? When actually. There's some um, really fundamental sure. but dull stuff yeah, <laughs> that, need, it, that it, needs doing and it's, um, it's, to make sure that if the wheels do drop off, yeah. then it's going to be okay. But they, they do go to a certain um, amount of like check-in and due diligence when it comes down to like getting the right contractor, getting the right architect and stuff like that. But I guess that's where it stops and it's, it's then like, okay, we've got what we think we need. And we can go ahead and, and, you know. There's a very simple way, in fact, that people can make sure that they've got the cover right. Right. Really simple. And actually, they probably need to go back two or three steps. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with the architect and the contractor. So when they let their contract or they get quotes in, actually, really what most people should have is a principal contractor. So rather than getting lots of separate trades in, if they just have a single main contractor, mm -hmm. then that's a really good start. Yeah. When they're talking to their architect, what they also ought to be doing, if the contract's anything over, certainly sort of 30,000, mm -hmm. is having uh, what's called a minor works JCT contract. You can buy a JCT contract from the Joint Contracts Tribunal website mm -hmm. for about 35, 40 pounds, mm -hmm. okay? It's a booklet you can't download from everywhere else because it's copyright, okay? okay? So you need to buy a hard copy, give it to your architect, okay? Get them to fill it in, so it'll have the architect's name as the contract administrator, then um, both you and the contractor in there, mm -hmm. okay? And there are three insurance clauses 
So 5.4 A, B and C, and the one you want is 5.4 B. Right. And that says that you as the employer, the person who's employing the contractor, will ensure both the buildings and the works, okay, mm -hmm. in the joint names of you and the contractor for the duration of the works, right. okay? And what that means, if you then buy our product or one of our competitors' products, somebody like Renovation Plan or Renovation, renovation Zone, probably not so much, but um, something like that, or you know, preferably go to a broker and get some proper advice. Um, what it means is that you'll be in control of the insurance on an all risks basis for both your existing structure, so the property that's there, and the works that are being carried out. Right. And if the contractor obviates their insurance or breaks terms in their insurance, which means their insurance won't operate, mm. you as the homeowner will still get paid. Okay. okay. So it's as close to a warranty free insurance contract as you're going to get. Okay. okay? Really important. Right. And the difference in cost, bear in mind during this process you can cancel your ordinary home buildings insurance because you don't need to cover it twice. Okay. Okay, so you get a return of premium for that. Um, but during the renovation process, it means you're going to have all risk cover for both. And the non-vitiation clause or the special clause that allows the contractor to break the terms and conditions uh, of the insurance contract, but you to still get paid, um, means that you've got complete peace of mind with it. It's really important. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be surprised if many people know that anyway. So it's really Almost good nobody, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and the reason is that architects don't like um, advising on insurance because they're very sensitive to their profession indemnity insurance. They don't want to get sued. Yeah. Okay. So they'll give you generic advice like insurance is a good idea. Yeah. And quite often, um, architects will ring their clients and say, well, you've got contractors coming in on Monday and it's Wednesday the previous week. Mm -hmm. You better just ring your insurers up and tell them what's going on. Yeah. And the clients, their clients' expectation is that either their broker or the direct insurer they're using mm. will pick up the phone and say, oh, thanks for letting me know, and just put the phone down again. Mm -hmm. When in fact, they've just opened a can of worms that requires a little bit of effort and attention to detail um, to actually get right. Um, it's perhaps worth talking about uh, some of the existing insurers, sure. household insurers in the UK. Yeah. Um, when we, at the same time as we did the focus groups, we bought insurance policies from the top 10 um, direct insurers in the UK. All of the names that you will see on the aggregator websites um, with their big advertising budgets, small fairy animals, all that sort of stuff. Oh. And, um, and we actually used a firm called Fairer Finance to do this, so it was done independently. We weren't, um, we weren't leading them again. Okay. I wanted to be really clear about that. And um, so we bought 10, top 10 insurance policies and we rang them all back a few weeks later uh, and just said, we're going to be undertaking some works. It's a simple um, rear extension on the property. And the house we'd insured was a straightforward estate home, about 150,000 rebuild, you know, so detached house. Yes. And uh, a normal detached house. And um, we said, where do we go with the cover? You know, this is about 70,000 pounds worth of works. Are we insured? Mm. Some of them we had to ring back two or three times to get a consistent answer because none of them really knew or were giving any advice. But what they were all clear about was that they weren't going to pick up any damage to the existing structure um, as a result of the works. So they were all looking to lay that risk off against uh, the contractor. Yeah. But actually, as the policyholder, it was up to you to find that out. They weren't going to help you. And so what you find is you're a sort of lay person with a big gray area that you don't really understand, yeah. particularly if you're in the direct insurance market. And actually what you should be doing is speaking to a specialist who deals in this niche, and it is a real hyper niche, I'm yeah. afraid, um, to actually get some proper advice. Yeah. But it's all around JCT and it's all about making sure that those little bits of detail are done. Yeah. I'm surprised that it is, it's still a niche though, because there, there are constant works going on, especially in the UK anyway, and especially in London. I mean, statistically, 
So we've done a bit of research on this in the last 12 months as well. Mm. So over half a million applications for planning permission on residential property going in the UK every year. Yeah. And I think the housing stock's about 40 million, is it something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, when you take that into the context of what's happening in planning, so in other words, the government are winding back a little bit and permitted development is um, enhanced from where it was 10 years ago, for example, mm -hmm. that probably means that there are double the number of projects that are going on that don't actually require planning permission or just require prior notification. So if you sort of work those numbers up, we think there are about a million and a half meaningful projects, and that could be something at 100 million or it could be something at 10,000, yeah. going on in the UK every year. Okay, And of those, 90% of them will be uninsured. That's quite scary. <laughs> It is quite scary, isn't it? Yeah. But as I said, unfortunately, the ordinary domestic buyer just sleepwalks into a situation mm. that they know nothing about because they've no acquired knowledge. And it's, it's a bit sad, really. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, what's the typical day like for you, Douglas? Um, I spend, during the springtime, as we are at the moment, I spend the majority of my time um, delivering continued professional development to um, architects, surveyors and insurance brokers around the country mm -hmm. on this subject. Okay. So what we're trying to do as a business is to get everybody to think the same way about yeah. insuring works so that wherever the householder goes to they're getting good advice from their architect, from their project manager mm -hmm. or from uh, their insurance broker. So at this time of year, it's a thousand miles a week around the country doing that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, more generally, I'm negotiating with insurers, uh, uh, the insurers who provide our schemes, uh, to provide the broadest cover we can at the best possible rates. Right. Okay. The problem with this class of business is it's massively unpredictable, mm -hmm. and that's why the mainstream insurers don't want to get involved in it. So unfortunately, most household insurers, um, although they're able to predict what their claims experience is going to look like mm -hmm. pretty closely within two or three percentage points, and they can move their pricing down to deal with that mm -hmm. so that um, it's a very competitive market and they've got lots and lots of data that helps them do that. In our class of insurance, it's exactly the opposite. So there's almost no data to support what we mm -hmm. do. And we don't see lots and lots of big losses or lots and lots of small losses, but we see a few very, very big losses sure. from time to time. Yeah. Okay? And that makes trying to understand the patterns of this insurance really hard. Mm. So consequently, we need, um, we need an, a number of different markets so that the people who support us are not in and out of our market having lost money or made money yeah. really quickly. Okay? And, um, and so a lot of my work is about negotiating with them to try and smooth the effect of that out right. so that we're always able to offer something mm. uh, to, um, uh, to clients, whether that's on a direct basis or through other brokers, which is the majority of our business in fairness. Um, then in addition to that, I'm negotiating with the insurers that we provide reinsurance products to. Mm -hmm. So um, again, because they don't want to write this class of business, we stand behind them uh, sure. to enable them to do it so right. they can give their policyholders a better service. Yeah. Um, so it's a multifaceted sort of... <laughs> there's, there's too much to do and not enough time. But what we've ended up becoming is, unwittingly if you like, is sort of works insurance evangelists. Okay. It's, it's a really um, odd term, but um, actually without education in this area, everybody's just floundering and all it, all it looks like is marketing. So we've sort of started from the engine room and trying to work forward to make sure that people that you're taking advice from as a, as a household renovator actually understand the right way to do things, or at least know somebody who does. That's the thing. It, it is, when you mention about the education, this is the primary reason why we do the podcast anyway. But it's so important to educate the everyday homeowner because... To be put in a position where they believe that they're doing something right for their home, for their family, and then 
to accidentally hire the wrong people or not do the right checks or not have the right insurance to just be left with nothing it can destroy uh, a homeowner you know and 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 then they are just felt with did they was what was it their fault you know because they didn't know enough so the the moral side of this is quite difficult for yeah. a homeowner and it's the sort of thing you know that you'd be sitting in the uh, the cinders of your home looking at each other saying well which one of us was supposed to do this yeah. um, I do ask the experts at Grand Designs um, from time to time okay. and I do get people coming in to speak to me who've had situations where usually they're with a direct insurer um, they've, they've done work on their property um, it's usually to do with fire so a serious fire has occurred and then They've gone to their home insurer and the home insurer said, I'm sorry, you're not covered. Mm. And at that point, if they're borrowing money to finance their home, as most people do, then their mortgage company forecloses and effectively there's a building plot there to sell um, and they've lost their equity. What's interesting is that the insurance industry don't use market value as a metric to actually provide insurance we're all about what the rebuild cost is right whereas for a homeowner the emotional journey they're going on is that either they need a bigger house because yeah. they've got a family yeah. increasing family or something like that or they're investing their money in their home mm. fairly certain in the knowledge that they'll get that money back okay yeah and unfortunately what none of, none of them really do is read their mortgage or bridging loan provisions which always say you must insure for the minimum of these perils mm -hmm. and subsidence okay mm -hmm. if we're providing an all risk cover then we're going to comply with all of that yeah. but generally speaking if an ordinary home insurer is providing no cover or just fire cover only then that homeowner homeowner is immediately in breach of their mortgage terms and conditions Interesting. and if a loss occurs and they don't get paid the loan to value position that they've had which has actually allowed the mortgage company to give them a mortgage in the first place is completely blown to pieces you know they won't be able to borrow any more money yeah because the mortgage value is probably higher than the site value or what they've got left there in the ground and if they've got no money to actually do the works again mm -hmm. they're really knackered yeah so Actually, again, a little bit of detail is really important here to make sure um, that you're not running those risks if you're not wealthy enough to do it. It could be worse than that, I think. I think even if like, you've inherited money, because that's the first time that you, you're going to be able to afford your first home, for instance, to do a renovation. And then if, if that, a situation happens like that and you've blown it, um, you're, you're, you're literally left with nothing. It's a long way back. Yeah. So um, we had a couple in North London who would got uh, a terraced house which was owned jointly with a freeholder. Um, they undertook a basement conversion without planning permission um, and so they didn't get building regs involved either. They did it under permitted development okay. um, which in hindsight for them was a mistake. But um, the actual works were completed but soon after the ground conditions changed and the basement collapsed overnight. Yeah. Um, the council issued a dangerous structures notice on the property because the gable end literally fell out and the property slumped and split away from its sibling property. This is a Victorian villa, so I mean, it's a properly built house. And um, so they went to the contractor and they said, you must be insured. He said, oh, I am. Yeah, that's fine. So he went to his insurance and he found out that he ticked the box online to say he was a painter and decorator because he got a nice cheap premium. Right. Okay. But of course that's not somebody who's doing basement conversions and the two things are quite different. But you know, when they had a look at his insurance, they just thought, oh, he's got public liability, so yeah. he must be right. Okay. Yeah. So no joy there. They sued the contractor. And actually, if you look at, when you're validating the contractors that you're using, if you look at their balance sheet at Company's House, most of them don't hold a lot of money in their business. No. So actually, if you put them under a bit of pressure, they're going to go bankrupt. They'll yeah. go into liquidation. And that's what happened here. Right. They went to their home insurers who said, I'm sorry, you didn't tell us about these works. And actually, 
what's happened here is defective workmanship, mm. which isn't covered. Mm. So they have nowhere to go. I guess it happens on the, the contractor side as well, because they could be misled about the insurance that they're taking out. One of the things that constantly disappoints me is that everybody feels they're an expert. Yeah. Okay. And although it's very easy to buy insurance online, nobody really takes much time to understand what they're buying. Yeah. They just assume it covers everything. Yeah. Okay. What's happened over the last 20 or 25 years is that with the advent of the internet, we've seen um, lots and lots of online providers, and those could be for contractors as well as mm. home insurers. Yeah. And because the concentration is so much on price and not what cover's actually given, what the insurers have done is hollow out their insurance policy so that when somebody like de facto starts to look at the same pieces of cover mm -hmm. within every insurance policy, they all make sure that they comply with that. Right. So they get good de facto ratings, okay? okay. But actually, when it comes to cover that they were giving 20 years ago automatically, if you like, that big grey area between what they said was insured and what they said was excluded, mm. there's no cover there anymore. So the same is true of a contractor. Yeah. And actually, really good contractors have probably got a broker telling them exactly what cover they need. Yeah and getting some advice and paying for that advice. It's just like using Absolutely. an accountant to do your tax return Absolutely. or a yeah. solicitor to do the conveyancing yeah. on your house or paying your architect or a structural engineer. Yeah. When you're doing works, actually, you're moving into no man's land, mm -hmm. so you actually need to get some professional advice, and that's where I think brokers, particularly the ones that you know we try to educate and try to get to do the right thing, mm. um, they can provide proper advice for people and unfortunately you know if you do want some advice you do have to pay for it yeah but when push comes to shove that might be worth it and you have to take the time out you you have to you know do your proper research to be honest you do and actually it's very easy to re you know if you google renovation insurance yeah um you'll come up with a number of firms uh, yeah. usually brokers who deal with this yeah. and actually do it as part of building your plan yeah. for your renovation projects. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to be spending 75,000 and you know the rebuild cost of your property is 150 or 200,000, mm -hmm. ring them up in advance, get a quote and put that in as part of your professional fees for the works. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest problem um, that most homeowners have is that when they do find out they've got to do something with insurance, it's all very late and they're not expecting to pay anything. Mm -hmm. So they've already committed all their funds. So when they ring up their broker and their broker says, actually, it's going to be £500 or £5,000 to yeah. do this, depending on the size of the project, so, they weren't expecting to pay it. And it all comes as a bit of a shock. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you put this in you your in. list of things yeah. to do to start with, yeah. then it'll be fine you'll understand it better. What terms does a homeowner need to abide by if they've got renovation insurance, for instance? So what, what are the terms under uh, getting a policy like that and making sure that you are fully protected if you have to claim? Okay. When we originally started providing this cover, because there wasn't really anything else like it, all there was was a commercial policy similar to the sort of thing that a contractor themselves would have, mm -hmm. and it really didn't work for the retail market. Okay. So what we did was completely redesign the insurance policy so that it was far more customer friendly. It was what we in insurance call a retail policy, something we could give to ordinary people. Okay? Um, and to make that work, we needed to make it an all risks product because that's all that people really understand. Yeah. To give you an example, those insurers that probably will stay on risk during works will provide something called flea cover only, which is fire, lightning, aircraft explosion. It's the most basic form of insurance. Okay. Let's say your project was taking 12 months, and at month 11, you had a storm claim. Nothing to do with the works at all. Yeah. But you rang up your insurer and said, actually, we've had a storm claim, you know, half the roof's been ripped off. Um, and they turn around and say, well, I'm afraid you've only got fire cover. Mm. Even though, the cause of the loss was nothing to do with the works, 
they're still not insuring it. Mm. Okay? So we knew when we provided this product that we'd have to do an orist product for the works, but also an orist product for the existing structure. Okay? okay? So we don't have any broad brush exclusions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, outside what any normal insurance product would have. Yeah. Okay, so we expect clients to be diligent. Obviously, any deliberate acts are excluded. Sure, um, that type of thing. But it was very much written with the high net worth insurance market in mind. But we haven't altered the policy actually for the true retail market. So I would think it's quite possible that some of the cover that people buy from us is actually better than they get under their standard household cover anyway. Yeah. Okay, um, and the way we deal with claims, I think, probably reflects um, on the sort of business we are. Right. Um, one of the things, principal things about insurance is that you're buying an intangible. You're buying a promise from us. Okay. Yeah. And actually, the only time we can demonstrate we're any good, other than the advice you got in the first place, was when we're delivering on that promise. Yeah. Okay. Um, a little while ago. Um, Aegeus, uh, who took the view uh, on a particular claim that they weren't going to pay because it was a bedroom rated policy. They thought the property was seven bedrooms when in fact it was only five, but they don't provide cover for seven bedrooms. I think that it, it was in the Daily Mail. The clients were away on holiday and the house burned down whilst they were away. Okay. And they might, well, <laughs> they just said they weren't paying and the clients went to the ombudsman, and basically the rest of us in the insurance market eventually shamed them into paying, okay? okay. But those people, I saw their, um, their uh, story in the Daily Mail, and um, so I rang them up, I rang up the mail, and I said, you know, I want to talk to these people. Sure. And um, obviously, I think they probably had to liquidate some other assets to repair their home in the meantime, and you know, they've got four children, you know, it wasn't great. And, um, and I said, presumably you're renovating what's left of your home. And they said, yeah, we are. And I said, well, actually, we'll do that FOC because I feel that you've been treated incredibly badly by somebody in our industry. And actually, collectively, the rest of us ought to do something to make sure that we turn that view around. That's amazing. And whenever we... Whenever we get into situations where we feel that genuine people are being dumbed down, we do our absolute best to help them out, mm -hmm. whether that's in terms of advice or products or whatever it is. Okay? So when we're dealing with legitimate claims, actually we pay 100% of legitimate claims. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we don't turn everybody over um, you know, and interview them uh, like we were um, in a prison of war camp, you know, we're not like that, okay? But if people have legitimate claims, we will pay them, and that's what we're here to do. Mm. And you can tell a lot about an insurance company or an insurance provider by the sort of companies they use. So our capacity is backed by Allianz, Sun Alliance, mm -hmm. and um, Munich Re, who are all A-rated proper insurers. They're not insurers that are domiciled in Bermuda or um, uh, somewhere else in Europe. So, so actually, um, you know, it's very important you choose somebody who you feel is genuine and is giving you proper advice and is using proper insurance companies to actually place the risk. Mm. And if you do that, uh, which means you won't be dealing with the cheapest person all the time, I'm afraid, um, you'll find you get much better value out of it because their approach to it is honest and transparent rather than somebody who's just trying to make as much brokerage as they can out of any given risk. And it's right when you say you won't be dealing with the, the cheapest, um, but it's not always about the cheapest, is it? It's, it's having the right cover for the right amount and believing that you're investing in that product. You're investing in your home, so you should be buying the right product at, at, that, at that price rate, I think. I have... Um... <laughs> I used to use a, a quote by a chap called John Ruskin, who was an eminent um, Victorian, both philanthropist and entrepreneur. And 
it was a couple of paragraphs that talked about the perception of value and if you always buy from the cheapest then you better hold some money back because you're going to need it yeah. uh, because you haven't bought a product that's capable of delivering what you expected it to sure. and by the time you've been through that process you may have just bought you may as well have just bought the right product yeah. and um, and what they were talking about really was value and I sort of got a bit of a beef with Tesco a few years ago when they started to use the word value in their lowest product range because they changed everybody's perception of, of what value was. was. Yeah. So value became cheap, not what it's actually meant to be. Mm. And, um, and so I would hope that from the insurance broken community, people actually got proper value for money in the same way as they would do using an accountant or solicitor. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're buying a professional service and actually that carries a cost. Yeah. And if you want to deal with, you know, you, you wouldn't knowingly use the cheapest conveyancing solicitor to do your conveyancing on your home. No. You'd use somebody that you trust or somebody that's recommended to you or whatever it was. Likewise with insurance brokers, do exactly the same. Have a word with your friends. You know, you've probably got a mate who runs a business who's got a decent insurance broker. Find that person out. It's the same as like if, if you're buying it's, it's, hindsight is a wonderful thing because you know everyone prefers to, to not get go down the right path sometimes but I think um, when you're buying products for your home you would happily invest a thousand pounds in the top of the range tap for instance to go in your kitchen or something like that but a question of insurance when it's 500, 600 you question it more and I, I find that quite odd because that policy can literally protect your home when you're renovating, whereas a tap is, is just a material item, isn't it? So it's uh, it's unfortunate yeah. that it's the people mindset. regard it in that way, but yeah. it, it's, it goes back to the point about being an intangible. Mm -hmm. You know, all you've bought is a piece of paper that looks jolly expensive, yeah. um, but actually what you've bought is a promise from somebody. And if you get the feeling on the telephone that you're never gonna be speaking to that person again, or actually you want to go to your local broker and sit down and look them in the eye mm -hmm. and say, this is what I'm doing, can you help? Yeah. You know, you want somebody who's got a reputation to protect, yeah. uh, and that's really important. That you hopefully don't ever have to use, but... But if you, you can, do, but, yeah, you it's going to come good for you. Yeah. That's the important thing. Can you just tell us a typical case, I think you've mentioned one already, um, where the claimant's not been awarded... Um, and the reasons for it. Um, okay, generally, uh, the reason that claimants um, will have claims turned down is that um, they breached the principle of utmost good faith, really. Mm -hmm. So they haven't told the insurer what the whole story is. Right. Um, insurance is only ever a problem if it's set up badly in the first place, mm -hmm. and that's a two-way process. So if you're ever in any doubt whether or not you should disclose something to, insure, to an insurer, you're in two minds yourself, then disclose it, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Because um, only when that arrangement is completely transparent can you be absolutely sure that what you're purchasing is going to perform yeah. the task that you've asked it to do, yeah. okay? So don't give people wriggle room by not disclosing something that's material. Mm. Okay, and what insurers have been stopped from doing is putting what's called conditions precedent in insurance. So, in other words, using terms and conditions in the policy to avoid paying claims, yep. even though those terms and conditions might have had nothing to do with the claim itself. So, to give you an example, if your house had burned down, but there was an alarm warranty on the policy that said it is a condition precedent of this insurance that that alarm must be set, and it wasn't okay. at the time at which the fire started, mm. then in years gone by, they'd have said, ah, oh, but you didn't have your alarm set, so we're not paying. You broke a condition of the policy, even though it wasn't relevant to the loss. Yeah. Okay? Nowadays, they can't do that. All right? But what they can do is say, and a lot of insurance policies don't have a proposal form anymore, they just have a statement of fact. What they can do um, is say, you didn't give us all the information, and actually if we'd known that information beforehand, 
then we would have charged more money or we would have declined the risk altogether. Okay. Okay. And then they end up having their insurance cancelled, the premium returned, and it's like it was never there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the majority of situations, I've talked about a couple of them already, yeah. where people have had serious losses, have usually been about declaring information at the outset. Okay. And if you're in any doubt, make sure you declare it. Really important. So, Douglas, we spoke um, a couple of episodes back uh, about um, method statements and how, it, how important it is for a homeowner to ask for a method statement from their contractor to understand how much detail is going to be in the work and what's going to be used, materials, etc. How important is that um, and, and, and can that really help a homeowner when it comes down to getting the right insurance as well? I think particularly method statements are useful when there's structural work going on mm -hmm. and particularly if the homeowner needs to make a notification under the Party Wall Act. Okay. So notifications under the Party Wall Act need to be made where they're changing the structural loading on the wall between the premises in its most uh, simple form mm -hmm. or um, the Party Wall Act could apply anything up to six metres away from a neighbouring um, property if you're doing deep excavation, so possibly a basement conversion, sure. where the, um, the works are over five metres in depth, for example. Okay. So at that point, as insurers, if we're trying to provide some cover for the exposure under the Party Wall Act, which is a strict liability between you and your neighbours, yep. which means that if you cause damage to their property, you must put it right. Mm -hmm. okay? So if we're trying to introduce some insurance cover there, which is over and above what the contractor's providing, for you, right. then we're going to want to see um, probably uh, some plans from the structure and calculations from the structure and engineer, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to want to see some method statements as well, because that tells us inherently what processes the contractor is going to use and whether those are going to be high risk or low risk. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody is doing lots of piling, sheet piling, there's lots of vibration and that sort of thing created. Yeah then obviously the chances of damaging a party wall are much higher yeah. than somebody who's using something simple like a sequential hit and miss technique mm -hmm. for underpinning, which sounds terrible, but, but it's actually great. Okay? okay. So method statements uh, are really important, and particularly if you're undertaking structural works, and that includes taking load-bearing walls out inside the property, introducing structural steel, that sort of thing. Sure. That's the sort of stuff you want to be taking a bit more interest in. Right, okay. Um, it's been really nice having you on. I, and can we just finish off with, what's the top five tips that you can give our listeners? Okay, top five tips for people renovating. Um, first one is talk to your architect early about insurance. Okay. Okay, that will lead to a conversation about a contract mm -hmm. and something like the Reba homeowners contract or the JCT minor works contract for works up to about half a million will probably be fine. Right. So make sure you get one of those. Make sure you stay in control of the insurance and there are lots and lots of reasons for doing that but the most important ones are that you know the premium has been paid because you've paid it. Yeah. We've talked about contractors sure. running out of money. Um, you know what the terms and conditions are, okay? And you don't know what the t terms and conditions of a contractor's insurance are. Mm. Um, if you buy the right insurance cover, then whatever the contractor does, that can't obviate that insurance. Okay. So you know we're always going to be insured. Okay. Right. Um, so that's point number three. Um, point number four, make sure your contractor is aware of the insurance that you've purchased. So you're not paying for something twice. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay because you don't want two lots of insurance covering the same thing. Yeah. So just say to the contractor, actually, we are insuring the works and the existing structure. You just need to have your liability part, okay? okay? And the last thing is, if you find this a complete minefield, go to an insurance broker who understands it, okay? Right. Pay for the advice in the same way as you would for a solicitor or an accountant. It's, insurance broking is a profession, okay? Just on the back of that, can we talk about the variations of change within a renovation that's going to be happening? So you get insured at the time of what you know is going to be done in the property. And then what happens if 
a, a homeowner changes or in, you know changes the work and adds something on, do they need to double check that and relate back to their insurance? What I suggest everybody does is just give themselves a bit of breathing space. Okay. So statistically, 87% of the renovations we insure go over time, okay? Yeah. 92% go over budget, right? Mm -hmm. So those figures are pretty compelling and overwhelming. Yeah. So if your project is scheduled to be 70,000, you might just want to give yourselves a bit of leeway and say, actually, we're going to insure for 80,000. Okay. Okay. Quite often in the policy, there'll be a little bit of leeway before under insurance kicks in. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of time, you might do exactly the same thing. Okay. So the average time that our uh, policyholders tell us their projects will be is just under eight months. Right. When I factor in all the extensions we make to their insurance, mm. It's actually just over 12. So on average, most people are 50% out. Okay. I have to tell you, having done a renovation project in here myself yeah. and in um, the house, uh, we thought we'd probably be four months. And actually, it took from December until the following August. So we took double the amount of time that we thought we were going to. Yeah. And thick end of double the amount of money yeah. as well. So. Even though I know a fair bit about this subject, I was every bit as guilty as everybody else of completely under egging it to start with. Yeah. And the sort of thing you'll come up against, really, is, um, well, you've made such a nice job of this part of it, why would we go all cheap or not spend the time doing this part? And provided you can afford to do it, you know, the inclination is to say, well, you know, whilst we've got the contractors here, they may as well carry on, get the job done right, yeah. because you only want to do it once. Exactly. And unforeseen things happen. Mm. So when we were doing a loft conversion on our house, uh, when they took the tiles off to put the Velux windows in, uh, they suddenly found that all of our felt and battening had had it. Right. So we ended up scaffolding over the top of the whole house and taking the whole of the roof off and re-roofing it. Yeah, so, that's a big unforeseen. You know, big yeah. unforeseen things like that do happen. Um, because we did a loft conversion, we had to get water into the top of the house. Yeah. Our rising main was only 15 mil, when actually we needed 22 mil main mm -hmm. to get enough water up there. So we had to put a new water main in. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that always crops up because we don't have any acquired knowledge. And, and, and as the everyday homeowner, you, don't, you, you won't know any of that until you start ripping out and then having conversations with your contractor. So always be aware yeah. that things can change and you actually might need to, you know, if you come across a structural problem, for example, mm. I would say that was a material fact and you might want to ring the insurers up and say, yeah. actually, we, weren't, we said we weren't going to do any structural works, but actually now we are. Yeah. Yeah. And does that change things? If um, anyone wants to ask you any questions or find out a little bit more about you, um, where can they find you? So uh, our retail channel is renovationinsurancebrokers.co.uk. Okay. Um, people are very, very happy to email me. That's no problem at all. Okay. So that's just Douglas.Brown at renovationinsurancebrokers.co.uk. Okay. Um, we have a number of underwriters who are used to dealing with uh, retail clients. Sure. So we can help with that. But we've also got a network of brokers. And the chances are uh, we might have somebody uh, who's relatively close to you, uh, who's actually had the proper training from us, understands what running in, uh, a renovation project and the insurance implications uh, of that are. Uh, so we can point you to somebody local uh, to look okay. after that for you. Are you going to be at any of the trade shows this year? So um, because primarily we're a business to business, yeah. um, generally we deal with uh, insurance brokers so we do those sorts of shows in terms of um, because you mentioned grand, grand designs, designs yeah. yeah so um, occasionally we'll have uh, some um, RC expert uh, attendance yeah. at grand designs um, or at the renovation show uh, from time to time yeah uh, as well right. but yeah. as you can imagine we're pretty busy sure. for a while so so yeah, much. it's the renovation season right now, isn't it? It is, so, yeah. It's yeah. crazy time. Yeah. Yeah. Alone, crazy time. But um, I suppose all I, all I really need people to do is actually give 
think about insurance and give it some priority yeah. within the contract. Yeah. Uh, whether you do it with us or you do it with somebody else, I don't really mind. I'd love you to do it with us, but you know, actually, just get yourself insured. Now, having the right cover is just a peace of mind, isn't it? So it's peace of mind, and actually, it's not hard. Yeah. You know, if you're speaking to a broker who understands what they're talking about, mm -hmm. 15 minutes. Yeah. In the context of the project, and probably rule of thumb, between a half and one percent of the project cost is a rule of thumb. Yeah. So actually, in the overall scope of things, it's That's pretty right. small. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really nice having you on. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Pleasure. Take care. Take care.